The Literary Luminaries Lecture began about 10 years ago, organized by the late Danny Mann of blessed memory. He conceived of the lectures as a vehicle for speakers who have enhanced Jewish literary culture in the Washington area. We've interpreted the term culture broadly over the years. Past speakers have included scholars such as Peggy Perlstein, then head of the Hebraic section of the Library of Congress, the founders of Carban Publishing, the then editors of the Washington Jewish Week. Two years ago, we heard from cookbook author and Jewish food scholar, Joan Nathan. And last year, Professor Maytel Orr of Georgetown University spoke on the Jewish other in Israeli Arab literature. This year's lecture also focuses on Israel. Professor Brenner will draw on his recent book to discuss the changing idea of a Jewish state from Herzl to Netanyahu. The topic could hardly be more timely. Michael Brenner is the Seymour and Lillian Abenson Chair in Israel Studies and Director of American University Center for Israel Studies and serves as Professor of Jewish History and Culture at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. He received his PhD at Columbia University and taught previously at Indiana and Brandeis Universities. I wish I had the time to detail at least some of his additional academic and scholarly accomplishments and service, but I think it best just to thank Professor Brenner again for joining us and invite him to begin. Professor Brenner. Thank you. Unmute yourself, sir. Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, yes, you're now unmuted, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me uh, to this series. Thank you for inviting me to Bethel. I am really sorry I'm not going to sit in the same room with you and uh, get to know you personally. I see a few familiar names here as well. But that's the new reality, as you said, and we'll try to make the best of it. So um, I will speak about 40 minutes and um, what is really important to me is afterwards that you have questions and I'll try to answer them. So Israel just celebrated its 72nd birthday and um, you would think this is an age where it's clear if this is a state um, where its people define, them, define themselves clearly either in terms of a nation, in terms of a religion. You would think it's a state um, where the borders of this state would be clear. You would think it's a state that has a clear legal basis, a constitution, and I could go on, but nothing of this actually exists. No generally agreed self-definition, no generally agreed, not to speak about recognized borders, and no generally agreed legal basis in form of a constitution. So I am not a um, political scientist, I'm certainly no politician, I'm a historian, and I think the answers to the questions why this is the case have to be looked for in history. I try to address them in my recent book, In Search of Israel. I can show it to you if you, I uh, don't know if you can see it. Um, there it is. It's called In Search of History, In Search of Israel, The History of an Idea. And let me start with the figure where the book starts as well, and it's a pretty obvious person to start with. Um, I started about 120 years ago in Vienna um, with Theodor Herzl, the founder of, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I started about 120 years ago with Theodor Herzl, the founder, often called the founder of the Jewish state. Theodor Herzl, I don't have to, I think, tell you his biography. It's pretty well known, born in Budapest, lived in Vienna. Um, I want to talk a little bit about his ideas because they changed over time of what a Jewish state look, would look like. And that's what I try to address in the book and in the lecture, the changing perceptions of how a Jewish state was, was conceptualized and also is seen today. So uh, it's quite a lot of changes and my journey begins with Herzl. It goes uh, through some of the major figures of um, Zionist politics and ideology like um, <clears throat> Weizmann, Jabotinsky, Achada Am, Ben-Gurion, 
up to Begin and uh, Netanyahu. So let's start with Herzl because after all, that's the beginning of it all. What was Herzl's idea of a Jewish state? Um, as always historians, otherwise it would be boring, like to argue what was the real position of Herzl. Um, I think it is important to start with the fact that it's not easy to translate the original title of his book, which in English is usually called The Jewish State. So he wrote it in German uh, and he called it Der Judenstaat. Now, for those of you who are familiar with German, it's not exactly the Jewish state, which would in German be called der Jüdische Staat. So it's not an adjective. It's the state of the Jews or the Jews apostrophe state. And there is a difference. And we'll get to this in a second. So it's not exactly clear what Jewish means, at least in the way we use it, the Jewish state. It's not exactly clear what a state means either for him. In fact, he uh, uses different terms when he talks about the Commonwealth or whatever we want to call it, but he doesn't always call it the state. He's in, in, in this book itself, the state of the Jews, a Jewish state, he, called, he speaks of the society of Jews. It's kind of more of a, of a economic unit he talks a lot about. In his novel, which he wrote a few years later, his very fascinating utopian novel called Old New Land, he calls it no longer society of Jews, interestingly. Now he calls it just new society. And we'll get back to this in a second too. It's more universalistic. And very often in his diary, and even in the Jewish state, he has an interesting other term he uses. Uh, he calls it the seven hour land. And uh, I guess if I were in the room now, I would ask you, why, why, why seven hour land? Uh, he thought this would be a society with a seven hour work day. Every person would only work seven hours a day. And you can kind of see where he's going here with this and many other ideas. He was not really interested in Jewish religion, Jewish culture. He wanted to set a model state for all mankind. But of course, it was Jews who were the pioneers, who would pioneer such a state. The idea of a seven-hour workday was so important for him that he himself actually drew the map of Israel sorry, the flag of Israel. And the flag of Israel, as he drew it, didn't look exactly like today. It had seven stars, seven stars for the seven hours of the work day. So you can see how important it was for him. Let me just read you one sentence um, of, of uh, his diary where he makes that clear. He says, at first, we shall only work on and for ourselves in all secrecy, but the Jewish state will become something remarkable. The land of the seven-hour working day will be not only a model country for social experiments and a treasure house for works of art, but a miracle country in all civilization. It will be a destination for the civilized world which will come to visit us the way it now visits Lourdes, Mecca, Sadagora. And here you actually can see the flag he painted in his diary. So in other words, he wanted a model society for all humanity. And there are many more examples um, about how he sees this state as a model for the liberation of all people who are suppressed, including the black people in the United States. He says this explicitly. Of course, he doesn't call, he calls them uh, a different term, but it's exactly what he says, but other, other suppressed minorities as well. By the way, um, he wasn't like super progressive in every way, but he believed in reforms and included uh, including that women should be able 
to vote like in the Zionist Congresses. At a time, first Zionist Congress, 1897, uh, where women did not have voting rights anywhere in the world, I think besides New Zealand. So here we actually see, I would say, where he was going. He was interested in creating a model society, a society which takes the best out of Europe, because he believed European civilization is the superior civilization. Uh, and another, another uh, text he describes how he would build a country, a society, um, where you would have English boarding schools, French opera houses, and of course, Viennese coffee houses. So the best of Europe, he could not, it's not true, by the way, that he did not think um, there, there were people living there. He was well aware there were Arabs living there. He, by the way, only visited once in 1898 uh, to meet the German emperor in Palestine, but he was aware there were people living there. He just was not able to imagine that the Arab Palestinian population would not welcome civilization, civilization European culture, um, improvement, agricultural progress, and so on. In that way, he was really uh, part of a European spirit. He also did not, as you might know, did not believe Hebrew would be revived as a spoken language. He believed it would be German, but also French and, Ger and, and English and Italian. The European languages would be introduced, uh, mainly, of course, German, he thought. So, in, in some ways, his concept of what he called the new society, first the Society of Jews in his book, The Jewish State of 1896. And then six years later in his novel, when he was writing his novel, O Newland, he called it the new society. Then it became even more univer universalistic. And one of the people who are the um, main, main protagonists and one of the heroes in Old Newland is actually a Protestant Prussian nobleman. And then he asks, can I be part of this new society? And he gets the answer from the then new elected president of the society, of course, we don't have any boundaries of religion. The only people who are not allowed to be a member of this new society are the fanatics who exclude others. And who is the main fanatic in Old Newland? It's an Orthodox rabbi who doesn't want to have the Arabs equal rights, doesn't want to grant them equal rights. So in a way, Herzl's vision was quite liberal, um, but also coming from a self-conceived upper position of a European, it was also probably not wrong to say a bit naive. He had critics during his own time who thought a Jewish state would be, or a Jewish society, and state is still very much a term in flex, would be something very different. And his most severe and, and sharpest critic as a Zionist, of course he had many Jewish, uh, um, Jewish enemies who were against Zionism, including his closest friends and his, uh, his Jewish uh, employee, employers at the newspaper he worked for and, 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 and the people where he wanted to organize the first Congress. It was in Munich and it was the Munich Jewish community and the German rabbinical association, both Orthodox and liberal rabbis who said, no, we are German citizens of Jewish faith. We don't want to live in, in the Orient. We want to move there and we don't want to give more ammunition to the, to the anti-Semites by saying we want to move to Israel. So he had a lot of non-Jewish people who thought he was either crazy or he was totally wrong. But he also had internal Zionist opponents. And the most fierce voice was Achada Am, a Russian Zionist. Uh, his actual name was Asher Ginsberg. And Asher Ginsberg, well, Achada Am, thought that it would be something different as a um, Jewish homeland, Achana Am was way more, aware, way more aware of the Arab resistance to a Jewish state 
to any plans to establish a Jewish state or commonwealth or society, whatever you want to call it. Uh, he knew there was more resistance among the Arabs, but he also thought it would never be possible for 15 million Jews to settle in that tiny land. Uh, don't forget, at the time, there were maybe 50,000 Jews living there. <clears throat> and the whole population was less than half a million. So the idea that 15 million Jews would all move there, as Herzl thought or hoped, um, was pretty irrational to somebody like a Haram. And more than that, he mocked, he ridiculed Herzl for being a European who transplants a little Europe into the Middle East. Herzl thought if Jews created their own home in the land of Israel, it has to develop its own culture. And by creating a spiritual, a cultural center in Palestine with a newly revived Hebrew language, this would radiate and create and strengthen Jewish culture in the rest of the world, which by then meant mainly Europe, because in contrast to Herzl, who became a Zionist, not because of his Jewish beliefs, but because of anti-Semitism. Herzl said, we wanted to assimilate. We just wanted to be Austrian or German or French citizens, but they don't let us. So we need our own state. So it was anti-Semitism was his driving force for becoming a Zionist. Aharam said, of course there's anti-Semitism, but he had a different driving force, namely assimilation. He said, we have to make sure that Jews survive culturally as Jews by creating a spiritual center and by reviving the Hebrew language. And both, of course, in a way, if you look today, both, uh, is, I always ask my students, is the state of Israel today closer to Herzl's vision, to Haram's vision? It's a bit of both. Um, but they, they very much criticized each other. And actually, Achana Am accused Herzl of what he said, assimilation on a national scale. He said, well, what he wants to do is to turn the Jews into people like everyone else, speaking German, behaving just like everybody else in Europe, but only because they're not allowed to live in Germany or Austria, or Hungary, or whatever, or France, they will do the same in their own home, but there will be no Jewish culture, there will be no Hebrew language. And um, that was his attack. Anti, he said it was, it was assimilation on a national scale. That's what Herzl wants. So you already have two very different concepts during Herzl's lifetime. Herzl's lifetime is pretty short. He died in 1904 at the age of 44. And uh, Achad Am was not the person to take over. He was not a politician. He was not the kind of very charismatic leader um, that Herzl was. And he could not and did not want to organize congresses. Achad Am kept writing. And he later moved to Tel Aviv, where he died uh, in the late 1920s. But when it came to new leadership after a certain gap, after a certain vacuum, um, after World War I, or already during World War I, the main person who now arose was Chaim Weizmann. And um, Chaim Weizmann, I, 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 again, I don't think I need to go into uh, all the biographical background, but of course Weizmann became the leader, um, uh, among other things, uh, because of his closeness to the British leadership during World War I. Um, he, the invention he made as a chemist brought him also very close to foreign, to the whole government, but especially Foreign Minister Lord Arthur Balfour. And when in 1917, Balfour, uh, for the as, as the first world leader, issued a major declaration saying that the Jews deserve a national home in Palestine, it was mainly Weizmann's merit. Now, by the way, what does it actually mean, a national home in Palestine? Very hard to define. A national home, it, it's not a legal term. It doesn't say state. Um, it doesn't say it will be a Jewish state. 
certainly not called Israel. It says in Palestine, what the borders is very vague, it's left very open, but still it was a major progress, a major success that now the leading nation and the nation who began to control Palestine, taking it over from the Turkish Ottoman Empire, would promise the Jews something, some kind of sovereignty in Palestine. Weizmann was very, he was a major diplomat. He arranged for, many of his successes were arranged behind the stages. Of course, he was also a politician who appealed to the masses, but his main talent was his diplomacy. He was quite successful, especially during and after World War I. What was his vision of a Jewish state? And again, I'm, of course, reducing this to a few um, you know, minutes or even seconds, and there is much more and much more complexity to it. But I think there's one anecdote which is told about him. Actually, it's told by the late Isaiah Berlin, one of the leading philosophers of the 20th century, Oxford Don and a Lithuanian Jew. And Isaiah Berlin tells a story where he went to a party in the 1930s in uh, Oxford, and Chaim Weizmann was a celebrated speaker at a cocktail party. And afterwards, one non-Jewish lady uh, approaches Weizmann and says, Dr. Weizmann, I don't understand. You, you Jews, you are the most talented people in the world. You've brought so many, you know, starting from the prophets uh, to Nobel Prize winners today. Um, your intellectual capacity and, 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 and you telling us you want a state like any other state, like Albania? And then Berlin tells us, he says, Weizmann's head uh, was lit up like a light bulb. And he said, yes, we want to be Albania. So what is behind this story? We want to just be a state like any other state. After hundreds, maybe thousands of years, where Jews were singled out, you know, as uh, by the anti-Semites as the main targets, but also by others who idealized Jews as the people of, of Jesus or the people of the Bible. We just want to be left in peace. We want to be like everybody else. And I argued in my book that this tension between, on the one hand, being creating a model state for all humanity, as Herzl said, it, being a light unto the nations, again, of course, a biblical idea, creating a model society on the one hand, and just being a state like any other state, this is an idea, this is an internal contradiction of the Zionist movement that would always stay with it. What kind of society do we want? Do we want to be better? Do we want to really set this model? Or do we just, we have enough of this, we just want to be like Albania. This was something which we will see for a long time. And David Ben-Gurion struggled with that in many of his writings and speeches. And let me also, read something he said actually in the government yearbook in the 1950s. He's asked to explain what the Jewish state is about. And he says, two basic aspirations underlie all our work in this country, to be like all other nations and to be different from all the nations. These two aspirations are apparently contradictory, but in fact, they are complementary and interdependent. We want to be a free people, independent and equal in rights, in a family of nations, and we aspire to be different from all other nations in our spiritual elevation and in the character of our model society, founded on freedom, cooperation, and fraternity with all Jews and the whole human race. And so on and so on. And then he writes, um, for example, he says, the establishment of Israel in our time is different from the establishment of any other country in the modern period. More than that, the struggle of the Jewish people is unique in the history of mankind. And therefore, he says, in contrast to all laws of logic and reality, 
without any example in the history of mankind. So there is the struggle. What should this Jewish state be? And of course, this is only one of the, of the issues the Zionists have to solve. A state like any other, a model state, a light unto the nations. How should it cooperate with the people who live there, the Arab population? And again, we have seen some differences between the two early figures, Herzl and Echad Ha'am. Let me bring another figure who became the main antagonist within the Zionist movement to Chaim Weizmann, and that was Vladimir or Ze'ev Jabotinsky, the founder of revisionist right-wing, more nationalist Zionism. And Jabotinsky, again, like Achada Am accused Herzl of naivete, he would do the same with Weizmann. He said, you know, Weizmann, you mean well, but don't trust the British, don't trust we can rely on them. We have to take it into our own hands. And we have to realize the Arabs will never accept the fact that we want to establish a Jewish state. So he had a much more, I would say, um, uh, confrontational force against both the British and the Arabs living there. But in the end, and I think this is interesting and often forgotten, in the end, Jabotinsky envisioned a society Again, was it a Jewish state? Not so sure. Where both would live along each other within one state and with equal rights. And let me read to you from Jabotinsky's, oh, no, I lost it, sorry. From Jabotinsky's last book, I hope I find it right now because it is quite fascinating. Um, here it is. Jabotinsky died in 1940, and in the same year, his last book about the Jews and the war came out. And in this book, which was actually published under two different titles in England and America, one is The Jewish War Front, the other is The War on the Jew, he quotes from a draft constitution that his own party, the revisionists, had made and how they envisioned a Jewish state, which in fact, if we look at it closely, is not really a Jewish state, it's a binational Jewish Arab state. Of course, it's a much bigger state on both sides of the Jordan, including today's Jordan. So he says the following. In every cabinet where the prime minister is a Jew, the vice premiership shall be offered to an Arab and vice versa, which I found very interesting because that means that the prime minister could be an Arab and then the Jews, the vice prime minister. Proportional sharing by Jews and Arabs, both in the charges and in the benefits of the state, shall be the rule with regard to parliamentary elections, civil and military service, and budgetary grants. Both Hebrew and Arabic shall be used with equal legal effect in parliament, in the schools, and in general before any office or organ of the state. The Jewish and the Arab ethno communities shall be recognized as autonomous public bodies of equal status before the law. Each ethno community shall elect its national diet, its parliament, with the rights to issue ordinances and levy taxes within the limits of its autonomy and to appoint a national executive responsible before the diet. So we have kind of a roof government, but then you have two different par parliaments within the state where they all, basically each community um, deals with their own rights. And where does that come from? It comes from the background where he grew up in the Russian Empire, uh, which just as the neighboring Austro-Hungarian Empire, both were not nas nation states. They granted more or less autonomy to the different peoples who lived there. And that was the idea Jabotinsky had grown up with and had internalized. And he knew it was very important for Jews, especially in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, to have this autonomy. And he said, you know, Jews and Arabs should have these autonomies in uh, a Jewish state. And I think this is something um, which every Likud politician today should read. You should read 
uh, what Jabotinsky had to say. There are politicians within the party which, which became the successor of Jabotinsky's revisionists um, who, who do follow this politics, especially uh, Israel's president, Rivlin, who is this kind of old school Likudnik who I think cares very much. What... I'm trying to turn him off, but he won't go off. Sorry. Um, so they try to, he tries very much to uh, give autonomy or equal rights to Arab citizens. We'll come back. Uh, I have a few more minutes and I'll come to an end. Um, let me mention maybe the last person before we come to today. And that's, of course, I would say Menachem Begin, who then became the first prime minister of Israel um, from the right wing, from now the Likud party, before that Harut and, 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 and revisionist party. And Begin still also had some, I mean, you know, obviously his politics was very different from, from the ones before. Um, but he already became prime minister in a different Israel than the one Ben-Gurion was prime minister, than the one Levi Eshkol, Golda Meir, or in the first term, Yitzhak Rabin were prime ministers. Of course, in 1967, Israel became a different Israel. I would call it the second founding of Israel with the Six Day War, with the expansion of territory, but also with the gradual, um, with the gradual growth of religious thought, not only at the margins of society, but at the very core of society. And not the kind of religious thought, the old Maftal, the old National Religious Party in the 50s and 60s, which went together with the left, had internalized, but the, but the thought of the new right of the settler movement, which now um, put land before state. It was more important to own the biblical land, the historical land, because of the history of the Jewish people there, than to control a state with a necessarily clear Jewish majority. And that's the, of course, ideology that also the Begin internalized, but that's the state he already, um, where he already became prime minister in 1977 that existed then. And what we see for the first time in Begin's tenure is the gradual, not only integration, but growth of religion as a part of Israel's self-definition. So when we go back, and let me just give maybe one or two examples. I mean, obviously his support for the settlement, his idea that Jewish, the Jewish state cannot retreat from any land uh, at least in the West Bank. Of course, the Sinai was different, but in the West Bank or, or Judea and Samaria, as you of course call it, um, which Israel owned and which in his view, in the Likud's view, was Israel proper. Um, for example, his first visit to the United States when he became prime minister and he visited Jimmy Carter, he stopped over in New York and he went to Brooklyn and he visited the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Now, I cannot imagine Golda Meir, Yitzhak Rabin, or David Ben-Gurion going and visiting the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He paid tribute to not only the religious views of many of his voters, he also expressed his deep conviction how important Jewish religion was for the Jewish state. The same, a few years later, um, he was the one who decided, or under his government, was decided, that El Al should not fly on Shabbat. That was not the case until the, er, until the late 1970s, early 80s. Um, and many other symbolic decisions or appearances that showed his very I mean, emotional closeness um, to Orthodox religious Israeli voters and, and people living there. Um, so, here we see a shift because all the concepts before, and that included Herzl and Nachadaan, Weizmann and Jabotinsky, were explicitly secular. It included Jabotinsky very much. By the way, Jabotinsky, um, one of the interesting, uh, you know, as a footnote, one of the things he thought, well, yes, we should of course speak Hebrew, 
but he found it, he, he would have preferred a Hebrew written in Latin letters. He wanted Hebrew uh, for a period in Latin letters. And he was himself a, a very important writer and translator. And, um, but he did not, um, he, did, he, he kind of followed Ataturk's example of Turkish in Turkey, which was also transformed into Latin letters um, from, from Arabic letters. So um, all of them favored and only saw the possibility of a secular state for the Jews. Herzl, a state for the Jews, but even a Jewish state, as Achad Am thought, would be a secular state only with, you know, Hebrew revived. Weizmann and Jabotinsky both thought that would be the case. And when Ben-Gurion gave far-reaching, conceded certain areas of Israel's society to the Orthodox when the state was founded, he did so because he believed they would remain such a small minority. They're important symbolically. We need them, especially after the Holocaust. But he never imagined that religion would become such a dominant force in Israel's society and politics. And my last chapter in the book actually deals with today's society. And one of the issues is the growth of religion in society, the growth of um, 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 religious politics in society. And I think one of the most important public speeches giving, given in Israel in the last few years was a speech given by President Rivlin, who is more from the right, not from the left, but he, he called it the four tribes of Israel. Not exactly tribes, but he talked about four segments of Israeli society who would be in their own world for most of their lives. Family, school, the people whom they married with, um, and, and their professional environment. And he talked about the four school systems, basically, secular Jewish, religious, national religious Jewish, Haredi, meaning ultra-Orthodox Jewish, and Arab Israelis. These are the four major school systems. And he said there is an interesting development, which many people in, in the bubble, like Tel Aviv, don't even notice, and certainly Many Jews outside Israel do not notice. He said it was very clear for the first decades of Israel, that's how the state defined itself, the vast majority of Jews, I'm sorry, the vast majority of Israelis went to secular Jewish schools. And then there were the others. And he said now, and the speech was given four years ago, or five years ago, now for the first time, statistics show that the majority of first graders in Israel do not go anymore to a secular Jewish school. The majority go to a national religious, Haredi, or Arab school. And that, of course, shows us something about the demographic development and the, the population with the greatest growth by far is, of course, the ultra-Orthodox population with the average number of children of almost seven per family. So it is a rapidly changing society. And I think that is what also is reflected in present Israeli politics, in the difficulties of getting any majority in a fragmented society. And if you look at Netanyahu over the many years he has been, been prime minister um, and in terms of building this coalition, it's very interesting that he has declared more and more in the last years, much more than in the 90s or even the early period uh, of his second term, that he would only go with the religious parties, with the ultra-Orthodox parties, because he recognizes this is where society is shifting towards. And if you look at, uh, at, at the last, I mean, how this whole mess began last year, the first of the three elections last year, it was by another right-wing politician, Avigdor Lieberman, saying, well, yes, I am 
actually part of the right wing. I agree with much of what Likud does and Netanyahu does, and for a while they were even uh, united as one political group. But he said, under no circumstances will I join a coalition of the ultra-Orthodox. So the idea of how a Jewish state is defined has changed now. And the border now, I would say, is more and more, not so much right and left, that too, but we see how much it fluxes is with the new government, if it ever comes with labor and the center of guns and the right wing and the orthodox. But it's those parties who clearly oppose a growing influence of the orthodox religious parties. And that is Tom, it's Yair Lapid's um, party uh, and it's Avigdor Lieberman's party. Those party, one center left, the other right, are the ones who would oppose a, any government with the ultra-Orthodox. So I just try to give you a few impressions how this whole idea changed. And of course, we could conclude with the nation, with the, <clears throat> with the law of, um, of Israel as a nation state, um, which kind of not only redefined, but defined what it means to be a Jewish state, um, certainly some extent at the expense of the Arab minority of Israel. Um, we could conclude it um, with the uh, plans of annexation of the Jordan Valley of this government, of the coming government and the Trump, uh, the support of course of the Trump administration and saying, well, the borders are in flux, the definition is in flux, and of course, the idea of Israel should be a secular or a religious state is very much in flux. But the, in, in my view, the foundations to many of these problems are very deep uh, embedded in over 100 years of Zionist history. They are embedded, of course, in questions going even back much longer, namely in the very difficult question, what are the Jews? That would take another few hours to discuss, so I'd be happy to answer uh, some of your questions. Uh, this is Jonathan Levy. Professor Brenner, thank you very much for an interesting and stimulating uh, lecture. Um, I will invite those who wish to ask questions to notify me through the chat function, uh, and I will call upon you and ask you to unmute and ask your own question. At the moment, there's one question in the queue, so I'm going to give people a few minutes, a moment to, uh, to add to that queue and, uh, and take the prerogative of asking the first question myself. And it really goes back to, the, to uh, you know, what you were sketching about the earliest uh, days of Zionism when there seemed to be you know, really an idea of a binational state or, or what today might even be called the one state solution uh, was a real possibility. And I was struck today in uh, the Times of Israel, there was an interview with A.B. Yehoshua, who um, I think is, would be considered on the left, although I think you're right to, you're, you're correct to suggest that some of these things don't break down left or right anymore. Anyway, you know, he came out in favor of the idea of a one state solution. So I wonder if you could just sort of comment on how, how you see uh, political uh, views evolving in Israel and, and to what extent there is actually some growing acceptance of the idea of, 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 of a one-state solution. Yes, thank you. I, I read that interview too. And Aleph Beit Yoshua as always, of course, likes to come out also provocative, but, but it was interesting because he was considered like many other um, intellectuals more on the left and certainly sees himself as that and always propagated for an Arab state and a Jewish state, a two-state solution. Um, I think many people today believe that the two-state solution is dead. Um, and one of the reasons they believe it is uh, not just the lacking support um, from the US government, which of course is, is, is essential. I mean, it may change if you know, the elections um, <clears throat> bring a different government in, in November, but I think What's more important is not so much the American administration, but the Israeli population. Again, that's what I was trying to refer to. There's a huge demographic shift in Israel. And, and the left, and the secular left, um, has you know, been in the process of shrinking for many years. That was, of course, 
the dominant force in Israeli politics for the first 30 years when the Labour Party ruled in Israel until 1977, and then only very occasionally since 1977. And, 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 and basically now the Labour Party has been, you know, is in total dissolution. They only got three members elected uh, into the Knesset. Two of them joined or said they will join the government. And the third one, um, she said, well, she won't. So there was one person kind of left as the single voice of the Labour Party um, who would be outside the new, more right center government. And there are, uh, and the same happened to Meretz, the smaller party to the, to the left of, of labor. Um, I mean, Tel Aviv is still a, a city, it's an island in Israel, where you see the secular and, 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 and the liberal uh, forces dominant, but outside of Tel Aviv, it's very different. And I think that's what Yoshua and others realize. They say, you know, there, um, there isn't, a majority for a two-state solution. And now let's make the best of a one-state solution. The problem with the one-state solution, of course, uh, and is, you know, Israel wants to be uh, a Jewish and a democratic state. And um, the question is, how can it be a democratic state if Arab citizens constitute not even 50, but let's say 45% of the population. And of course, they're also, uh, they have higher, um, uh, the birth rate is higher than among secular Israelis at least. And that's the big question. How can it be a Jewish and a democratic state? Either you do it like Jabotinsky and give them equal rights, um, but then you might have to deal with the situation where you have an Arab prime minister and a Jewish deputy, as he said, or vice versa. Um, I don't think that most Israelis, Jewish Israelis are ready for that. And I still think there is no convincing answer for one state solution for a Jewish and democratic state, you know, unless you expel the Arab population, which would not be very democratic. Uh, um, or unless you give them second rights only as second class citizens, and then you would in fact have some, uh, some kind of apartheid, which I think even many on the Israeli right don't want. So it's, it's uh, a problem which I don't see uh, how to solve that. And you also, I mean, if you look at the Trump plan, you have all of these little islands. It, 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 it doesn't look like a real viable state, this kind of Palestinian entity. Um, and I guess if any of us were a Palestinian leader, we could not say, oh, great, let's just accept it. So there is still a lot, I think, um, open in, in this one state solution. Mm -hmm. I didn't see an answer by Alec Beit Yehoshua either. Yeah, but I, I understand talking... that they think that the, you know, the second state, this two state solution <laughs> uh, dies with the, with the death of the Israeli left. Yeah. Yeah, no, he, he spoke in general terms. Um, so uh, the next question in the queue comes from Jonathan Simon, and I will invite him to unmute himself and ask the question himself. Okay, uh, this is a technical question which might have implications for long-term one-state solution. The question is, uh, is the current Haredi portion of society, which you said has a larger birth rate than the rest, uh, economically self-sustaining? by which I mean producing wealth for the country and or paying taxes to support whatever services they get? Yeah, that's, that's a very important question. Um, right now, no. Uh, right now, they, of course, live from many benefits the state gives them. Um, but they're also willing to live at a much lower level than you know, most of middle class Israelis. It is by far the poorest population. And by the way, I think this question is very important. I think, in my view, it's way more important than military. Uh, you know, the, the obligation to serve in the military, which of course is also a big political question. But the military can survive without them. If the ultra orthodox population grows, as is predicted, to twenty, maybe twenty five percent of the of the overall population. Um, 
it's a big economic problem because right now Israel, you know, at least until the Corona crisis, Israel's been doing very well economically. The startup nation, I mean, Israel has been as a big success story. Herzl would have loved that. Um, but if you look closely, the gap has also grown enormously. Israel was a quite, I mean, I'm sure there were some of you lived in Israel in like the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, it was a society which was way more equal than many other societies in the West. Today, it's one of the largest gaps between rich and poor. And one of the reasons is, one of the reasons is indeed the poverty, extreme poverty to some degree of the ultra-Orthodox population. Um, and that is going to be a problem for Israel. And the second one is the extreme low level of general education. And that, of course, is related. Israel's education system, if you look at it in the secular system, is actually pretty good. Some, you know, that explains why many Israelis are so uh, innovative and so on. But if you look at the Haredi school system, of course, it's mainly a religious uh, Orthodox education. It's, it's uh, one of the worst worldwide if you only take this system in terms of general education. So there is a huge gap in education and in the, in, 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 in econo in the economy. Right. Thank you. So I have two additional questions in the queue, both of which are interesting and important in their own way. And at a minimum, I hope we can get through the two and then uh, we'll see if there's time left afterwards. So I'll invite um, the personage known as English Now Baltimore to ask his or her question and then we're going to move to Deborah Miller's question. Um, I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, yeah. So I asked one about the similarities between the ultra-Orthodox here uh, in Israel and, and the um, um, evangelical far right in the U.S. historically and now. What are the similarities? Okay. So I would say the similarities between the ultra-Orthodox and the evangelicals is, they're very different. They're very different. And the population I would compare to are the so-called national religious population the settlers and, 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 the, and, and the circles around them in Israel. There is a lot of comparison. People who mix politics and religion, who think it is very important to bring religion into politics. The ultra-Orthodox traditionally have a tendency to keep themselves apart from politics, um, even to keep themselves apart from other Jews in society, with the exception of Lubavitch, but of course most ultra-Orthodox are not Lubavitch, they're not Chabad, and, and some of them, as you know, uh, some of the ultra-Orthodox in Israel vehemently reject the existence of a state of Israel. So that's another issue which Rivlin addressed in his speech. Both the Haredi population and the Arab population, which are growing parts of the Jewish society, of the Israeli society, are non-Zionists. The ultra-Orthodox, they accommodate, some of them do accommodate living in the Jewish state because they get a lot of benefits. But there are extremists among them who every uh, independence day of Israel go in Me'ar Sherin, burn Israeli flags. And there are even graffiti, which you might have seen all over, which have the Star of David, the Israeli flag equals the swastika. I mean, it's terrible. And, and many of the ultra-Orthodox are not, um, are not uh, Zionists per se, but they accommodate themselves with Israel. But the national religious, the Zionist national religious, um, I think have a lot of in common um, with the uh, far right uh, evangelicals in, in, in the US. Thanks very much. Uh, so now I'm going to invite in a moment Deborah Miller to unmute herself and ask her question. And I'll just note for everyone's reference, including that of Professor Brenner, that someone else has sort of added a, a brief comment on her question uh, regarding the use of the term racist. So I will invite people to read that comment and keep it in mind um, as uh, Professor Brenner addresses the question from Deborah Miller. Hi, uh, Professor Brenner. Uh, first of all, I go to many of the lectures at the center, and so I'm a big fan of uh, your work and uh, AU's education. I'm actually taking a course at GW on Israel education with Ari Dubnov. Very um, good. Yes, and my son is uh, studying um, at UPenn. 
and we have a difference of opinion on Herzl, a different generation. So I wanted to hear your um, uh, answer to this. How would you characterize Herzl's attitude toward the Arabs? My understanding um, sort of fell in line with what you were talking about, about being humanistic and universal, um, but you still might consider it patronizing. But um, my son uh, challenged that notion after reading Old New Land and characterized uh, Herzl as racist, such as when he refers to Arab villages as filthy nests. And here's my son. <laughs> Hi. Um, you know the old Jewish joke when, when, two, when, when a person goes to the rabbi and in the end, you know, you're both right? No. What I try to explain to my students is that you have to understand people in the context of their own time. So I would rather go with patronizing because, you know, that was the language of the time. And you will find very few people who are different in 18, who write differently in 1896. Um, in fact, most would be way more racist. Herzl, if you, look at Old Newland, one of his heroes is an Arab, right? If you read Old Newland. Um, and I mean, he's this like, you know, Turkish speaking, um, probably member of the Arab aristocracy in Palestine, but still, he's a good guy. And the bad guy in Old Newland is the rabbi, the Orthodox rabbi. So. I don't see this as racist because if it's really racist, if we define racism, we think a moment, what does racism mean? Then that wouldn't make sense because the Jew, one Jew is the bad guy. Of course, many Jews are good. In that. And the one Arab is the good guy. But it is patronizing. It is patronizing in the sense that he thought, you know, the European ideas are superior. But I think it's important to keep in mind that the term race and racism has also a clear meaning. And that would mean every Arab, by the poor definition of their race, would be inferior. And that's not the case with Herzl. Yeah. I guess you could just say, though, that even though the main character, Rashid Bey, the, the Arab character, is a hero, he's the only Arab in the whole piece that has a speaking role. And even his role is pretty limited, and he himself makes pretty condescending remarks about Arab people. So he's almost like this assimilated Arab who is only worthy because he assimilated to this Jewish kind of nation. And yeah, I do agree it's in the context of his time that Herzl may have been different, but if we're looking, if we, if we're looking at the, it ha, Zionism has European roots and, that, and Europe has racism. And so it, it, that can get kind of conflated or, or maybe can convolute the, um, the aims of Herzl regardless of how he compared to people in his time. Sure, I mean, I wish we can have a chance to discuss this more in more detail, um, but from today's perspective, it certainly looks like, but I think we have to be careful not to call everything racism, racist, which looks racist today, but was written in a very different context. And I don't wanna, you know, I, as I said before, I think he was naive in many ways, he was conden condescending, um, um, but racism in 1896, I think, meant something different. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And there's, by the way, a great, very new biography of Herzl by a Harvard professor, Derek Pensler, which just came out. And we are hoping to host him in September at AU. Who knows what's happening in September, but that's all right. We'll see him on Zoom if we don't see him uh, in physical. Right, and it actually will be the first Sonnenschein lecture, and I think Helen Sonnenschein is on here as well. So uh, I hope you can all be part participating, either real or on Zoom. So I've been deputized to ask, uh, well, actually, all of a sudden, a couple more questions have come come up here. Well, one of them is, is well, they're to everyone, so you can see one of them uh, is a commentary on the roots of Zionism, uh, tracing it back to the Bible, to the Hebrew Bible, rather than to Europe. Um, then uh, iPad has asked everyone, or has you know, shared with everyone, question regarding 
uh, incitement and calls for exclusion of the Arabs. And then uh, I've been deputized to ask a question, and I hope you'll give us a few more minutes of your time. I'm fine, yes. Okay, so uh, uh, the, uh, Ed and Shelley have requested me to present, if time permits, do you see the COVID-19 crisis having any impact going forward? For example, greater Arab-Israeli cooperation, or is this purely transitional? So with respect to all questioners, I think that the, the COVID question is one that can be handled in a relatively compact way. Uh, the one about incitement and calls for exclusion, I think, is a, a much bigger discussion. So I'll, I'll ask you to comment on the COVID and then say whatever you would be in a position to say in a relatively brief way, recognizing it's not going to do justice to the question, uh, the other one. Thank yeah, you. like so much. Um, let me <laughs> actually refer to, so at AU, at our Center for Israel Studies, and, and I invite all of you, by the way, if you are not yet on our list, we, 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 are, we were the first Center for Israel Studies in the US, uh, inaugurated by Shimon Peres over 20 years ago. And I think we're still very active, probably, if not the most active, one of the most active centers. And we try to bring a lot of different points of view, a lot of different, uh, um, not only politics and history, but also art and theater and all aspects of Israeli culture and business. Um, so we just had a, a Zoom uh, series at our center. And the last speaker was Fania Oz Salzberger, a historian from Haifa and also the daughter of the late Amos Oz. And she made a, she was also asked this question. And I think she gave a, an answer that I would paraphrase here. Um, it showed, interestingly enough, the two segments of Israeli population, which are so much in the focus now, which I also talked about, the ultra-Orthodox and the Arabs in, in different light. The ultra-Orthodox, uh, um, you know, for many reasons, uh, just like in Brooklyn, uh, also in Bnei Brak or in Measher in Jerusalem, um, unfortunately, that's where most of the COVID victims uh, were found, partially because they didn't follow, or many of them, I wouldn't say they, many of them didn't follow all the rules as soon as they should have done and so on. And it has to do with a lot of factors. Um, who they are and 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 how they see their place in society, um, but but that was one of the major uh, communities affected by COVID nineteen. And then she said, with the Arab population, we see something different, very interesting, because an way over proportional mem members of the Arab Israelis are working the health service as doctors many Israeli Arabs are doctors in Israeli hospitals and nurses and other health workers. So they were seen and they saw themselves also as becoming really an integral part of this healing process in Israel. Now this is a very optimistic view and you know with respect to integrating the Arabs through this crisis. I do not know how much of this will remain once this is over. But right now, I think many Israelis um, are confronted with the fact that, that many, I mean, many Jewish Israelis are confronted with the fact that many Arab Israelis are very much involved in helping Israeli society, no matter if Jews or Arabs, to get out of this. Um, do you want to take a quick stab at the incitement, or will we, should we leave that for another time? I'm sorry, what was that? The, 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 a last minute question, how do you see the constant incitement and calls for exclu exclusion of the Arabs? Uh, um, I'm right. wondering how that can be right. taken care of right. briefly, and I'm not trying to slight the questioner who goes by the name iPad, but we're, we're right. pushing up against our time. Uh, right, I mean, it, it, it demands, of course, a lot of time, this answer, but it, I think it's, it's, um, it's a sad development uh, if we want to consider, you know, Israel as a more, um, progressive Western and and liberal society, but it's it's a development. Unfortunately, so much in sync with the rest of the world uh, here in the U.S. and in Europe as well, where democracies are struggling um, to fight for I would say democratic uh, values, which view all of its citizens equally. And 
and uh, we see this in Israel as well. Of course, the reasons in Israel may be different than in this country or in Europe. There has been a long history of, uh, you know, Arab resistance to the idea of Jewish, ex of Israeli existence, of the existence of a Jewish state. And you might argue, of course, it's also understandable from their point of view, but that didn't help to, to uh, help the understanding of many Israelis um, that both should be treated equal. But no matter how we want to see it, even in Israel proper now, in the Israel without the occupied territories or whatever you want to call them, um, there are over 20% of Israeli citizens who are Arabs, and many of them call themselves Palestinian Israelis now. And I think uh, as it behooves a democratic state, they should be treated equal. I think it is not conceivable forever that no Arab party um, would be invited to be part of a coalition government in Israel. I think Jabotinsky would have actually seen this different as today's leaders of the right wing. And, um, and, and, and it actually may be the fact that even in this coming government, which has you know, a lot of critics, uh, there is rumor that the, there will be a first um, Arab uh, minister appointed, but that's a first step in a very long process. Well, uh, Professor Brenner, thank you very much, not only for an interesting and stimulating lecture, but for cogent answers to quite a diverse range of, of questions. Uh, we appreciate it. Just a reminder, this is the book, In Search of Israel, The History of an Idea, published by Princeton University Press. I've been asked by uh, uh, the Bethel Library Committee to remind everyone, but particularly members of Bethel, that the book will be physically available in our library once we open up again. Um, but there's nothing that says that you can't support an independent local bookstore by acquiring your own copy. Anyway, uh, I think we're going to close out now. Uh, let's all express that. Uh, you can unmute yourself for the purposes of expressing your appreciation to Professor Brenner by clapping or whatever you want to do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paula. Very good. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And I hope to see you all at some point at American University. Well, you've got a great program, and I'm sure you will. Yay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yay, you. <laughs> okay. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you, John. Bye, Adrian. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Jonathan, for arranging this. Glad that it all worked out smoothly in the end. Well, that's, uh, that's, um, thank you very much. Marcus, Miss Marcus. Okay. Marcus, the lady who's the Burkos friend. Mm -hmm. Uh huh, I know. Moved also to, uh, Ingleside. Okay, I'm going to close off the recording now.